we, uh, so this just tells you a little bit about ourselves. I'm Barry and Laura, do you want to say hi? Hi, um, I'm Laura and I'm an attorney, obviously, you know, and we're really excited to be here with you. We come from, um, both come from diverse and different backgrounds, but love working together. And we're excited to be here. We want to start talking about, you know, when we talk about keeping the work sustainable, um, the first thing that we maybe need to identify is keeping it sustainable from what? So we'd love for you to put some ideas into the chat, um, talking about what are your, what are the sources of stress for you in your practice? Um, again, if you can just, people can put some ideas in the chat, like what brings stress into your practice, um, into your, specifically your child-focused immigration practice, because we all know that the practice of law can be stressful no matter what you're doing, but specifically your child-focused immigration law practice, what are the sources of stress? Okay. Right. Vicarious trauma, deadlines, not having enough therapists. I think, um, that's going to so much demand and lack of resources. Too many cases and clients, not enough time. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Um, knowing whether or not the child, I think that's knowing that the child understands and knowing what their fears are, mm -hmm. guilt for not completing the work fast enough. Um, one of the things that I really like about the answers that we're, that we're seeing is that it's like you all read the um, read the topic of our presentation, and that these are stresses that both come from the outside, as well as from the inside. The inside being things like the guilt. The outside being things that we can't control, like lack of resources. Um, stress comes from asking children difficult things, like about when they are separated from their parents. Um, these are all really great um, great answers. We had um, some of our own ideas also about different um, sources of stress in our practice. Um, but again, these are all these are all really great answers. Um, you know, we think that some of the sources of stress come from, like you've said, hearing kids talk about difficult things, hearing them talk about their fear in their home country, hearing them talk about, um, experiences that no child should ever have to go through, having a limited capacity to meet children's needs. I think that we've um, seen some of seen some of those um, in the answers. Going back to the chat, um, one of the things that I don't think that um, we've seen a lot of in the chat, but one of the things that we identified as a potential stress, is having a hard time being able to reach the child. Like maybe you do have a tool that you, a tool or a resource or a way that you may be able to help support a child um, in their immigration case, but there's a barrier because of their sponsor either being non-responsive or not connecting the calls. And maybe it's for nefarious reasons and maybe it's just sometimes because people are, working and aren't necessarily available when we're available. Um, so I, you know, I really like these answers. Guilt and understanding my role in the child's life. Um, that's very powerful. Um, I mean, these are all powerful, but I think that, you know, like that again, like goes to, there's so much need and I think that that can be said, like there's so much legal need, but also children have so many needs and we're maybe just like a tiny nail in something that's a, something that's exploding. Um, and we have limited capacity because we have limited expertise as attorneys. Um, so these were, you know, I think that the, you've all done a great job of identifying them and of identifying stresses, and they are generally consistent with things that that we came up with. Um, and there are, I think the other thing that these answers have helped to uh, identify is that there are really different layers of stress. 
you know, there's the layer again inside working with the child, layers that are on that that are related to our practice, and then layers that are sort of beyond our control that are due to the stresses of the world that we live in. Right. So part of what we wanted to do was to give you some scaffolding in how the brain works and why all these stresses compile and make the work harder. And so um, we appreciate everything that you shared in the chat. I think the last one or two are really powerful, the, um, the ways in which children are dehumanized um, throughout their entire immigration process in a way that which this, in which the system punishes children for expressing valid emotions. Um, and, and so we do, we have a system that really punishes people for being distressed. Um, it's, and the co costs are very high, right? You know that the costs are very high with children and adults in the court setting in particular. And so in our work, we find it really helpful to have an understanding about how the brain works and understanding why it can be so hard to do some of the cognitive um, and expressive things that we all need to do in our work and also that we need our clients to do in order for them to get the representation that they deserve. And so um, we look at this diagram of the brain and the main thing that I want, we're not like, you don't need to know the names of the regions of the brain, but it's also really helpful to understand though that the brain works in a sequential way. All of the information from your senses, it's all that information from the outside world, sensory, and the inside world, like from your body and your mind, comes in through the brainstem, it's processed, moving upwards. And so the brainstem is kind of screening for survival threats. And so they always call that the primitive part of the brain. This is probably familiar to some of you. Um, if the brainstem is perceiving a threat, we kind of stay in that region of the brain. If the brain seems like, oh, everything's okay, then we can move on to the middle part of the brain and the middle part of the brain responds to what's going on as well. And so sequential and the access that we want to the cortical part, to the, you know, where all memory and narrative and all of those things that we need for the work is all the way at the end. And it also develops that way. So the brain develops and works in a sequence way. So the brainstem is the gatekeeper. And um, so if it senses a saber-toothed tiger, your heart rate goes up, fight or flight, and releases all the stress hormones. Um, and what we know from trauma is that it, the more someone has gone through that, the more that the fight or flight system can be deployed, even if there's not a saber-toothed tiger. Um, so I always give the example of like, you know, that you still go into fight or flight, but you're actually looking at a stuffed teddy bear, you know, that like you're, you're just, the gauge is off and it's deployed all over the place. And, um, and we all know, like you've probably had clients who shut down when they're admonished and that would be part of it. That's a, a defense mechanism of kind of pulling within. Um, the next region of the brain goes into coordination and movement. And then the more advanced things like connecting with others and experiencing pleasure or the limbic. And so that's where you're developing rapport with a client. Um, and, and it's through relationship and pleasure that we can then access the next part of the brain. You can picture growing up, like your readiness to learn is dependent on doing all of these things. And also um, your ability to function later on. So, if there is a threat to survival, the um, stress response system will then um, send out signals that we need these brain chemicals for survival so that I'm ready to fight or flee, you know, all the the blood stops flowing to your extremities and it focuses on the core in case you're attacked by the saber-toothed tiger, but you're more likely to survive. And you're figuring out, are you fleeing? Are you fighting? Or do you go in, do you play dead? Or do you go into freeze? And so we know those are dissociative responses. And um, one of the most important things to know is that there's a flood of cortisol. And I know that's a lot in pop culture. There's that information about cortisol flushing, flooding the system. And when that happens, the job of it is to shut down your higher level thinking 
so that you can be more responsive in your primitive reactions to the threat. And so literally when, the, when there's that much of a trigger, um, the cortisol, you'll notice it says here, it shuts down the brain chemicals that aid healthy neuron development. So in a child, not only does it shut down the functioning, but it shuts down the development. So the pathways are not growing in the same way, the pathways that have been triggered are growing. And that's where we get to the lasting harm of what we call adverse childhood experiences. Those are references on your handout as well that if you don't know that body of literature is very helpful for your legal work. There's um, helpful ways to understand what kids have been through. Um, so that's step one. And, and um, after step one, there's really not a step two, like your system is focused on survival. So once you've gone into fight or flight, it's the calming down is a process. And that's important for us all to know. It's kind of like if you've ever been, I don't know, in a fender bender on your way to the store by the, you know, like, and then you continue and you go onto the store, but then you like buy all the wrong things or you find the store overwhelming, like your system has to calm back down. And you've also probably experienced this in court settings too. Um, when this is happening persistently or repetitively as with our child clients, that can really deplete the organism and it changes the way the brain develops. And so that's really important for us all to understand um, that part of what lies ahead for them is more complicated than obviously we can solve them one day, but by understanding this way the stress response system is working, you would better be able to choose how to interact with them in a way that doesn't agitate that stress response system and maybe even soothe it. Um, and so we get to this idea of, of regulate, relate, and reason. You know, those are like the like your tricks of the trade that you always look at is this client, is my colleague or am I regulated? And am I able to connect a little bit? And then knowing that if I'm able to do those two things, then the cognition part comes. Um, so that you don't have to hold in mind that whole map of the brain because that's a bit much. This is a more simplistic way of looking at it. Um, that it's just kind of a flow chart you know, the, and all the information goes upward. And um, so you can't get to the top of the nervous system. Um, your clients can't, your colleagues can't, um, your children can't, no one can without calming the nervous system. And um, so any difficulty in focus, memory or, connect, or connection, it's biologically the outcome of being in fear or distress. Um, and in your handouts, you have links to Dr. Bruce Perry, um, who's cited on this slide. His books, like if you wanted to read one thing on this, I would read his books, either one of them. What Happened to You he is the book he wrote with Oprah Winfrey. And The Boy Who Was Raised as a Dog is his original book. And it's just case studies where he really, um, and he writes in a very engaging way. So it's an easy read. Um, and you also have links to his videos where he explains these things as well. Uh, he explains them probably better, in my opinion. <laughs> so um, in addition to that, what I've just given you, there's some basic brain development information that you should know about, um, adverse childhood experiences, as I've said. Um, that's, a, that's, that's a whole body of literature where they've demonstrated that the more um, traumatic experiences someone has had before the age of 18, um, the higher risk of other medical and psychological problems later on. And it's a very cause and effect, it's very concrete and it's very good research. And so now you're finding that pediatricians and other professions are using ACEs. And I do believe the SIJS, one of the screening tools that I've seen actually is the ACEs checklist adapted for children. So it's, I see it interfacing with this work already and that's spot on, that's exactly where we wanna be. The other concept that you want to know about is blooming and pruning that the brain develops in a use dependent function in a use dependent way. And so that means um, it's kind of like why kids can learn a language when they're really little, but then it's harder later on that like the more and if you learn Swahili, like 
then those, those the pathways develop there. But if you didn't learn Swahili, the Swahili you know neurons are not necessarily going to be as available to you later on. It's going to be harder. And so blooming and pruning is is part of what happens in understanding that. Um, at a very young age, children have so many more neurons um, and neural connections and synapses as they will have in, an, in adulthood. And that's why these tender years are so tender because they have, there's much more capacity for growing the blooming, but there's also the capacity for pathways to become over dependent upon and over triggered and um, also not using some of the pathways that are really helpful. Um, and then I've talked about the hormone releases and also um, when we're in fight or flight, there's just reduced access to self-regulation, decision-making, learning all the things that we rely upon in the work. Um, you know, we thought that before we like jumped into the sustainability, it was really important for a Sherry to give us that like crash course and how the brain works, because now that we understand how the brain works and the pathways, I think it makes it easier for us to understand how the brain's functioning can really impact our work with our impact our work with our clients. Um, and so again, if you think about the brainstem, <laughs> if the brainstem's not clear, that like if as an attorney, your brainstem it, like isn't clear, you're not going to reach your the cortex and your executive functioning may be impaired. Your ability to organize for court hearings, your ability to respond to deadlines. Um, and again, that's because you as the attorney um, may be experiencing some form of trauma. So it's really important to think about this because it's not just about our clients experience it, but it's we as practitioners experience it and it literally impacts may impact our ability to practice. Um, something that we didn't point out at the beginning but this is maybe an ideal time is that the slides that talk about that are really about ethics have this nice gold emblem on them to help you identify it and talking about the ability to practice is like is an ethical question um so again this slide obviously has some ideas that we come up with with ways that the brain's functioning may impact an attorney's ability to work with clients we would love to um, see, we would love to hear from you personally, some of the ways that trauma has impacted your work with, your ability to work with children. Um, this is not to put anybody on the spot, but um, because this can feel vulnerable, but to acknowledge that it happens, to, mm -hmm. that it happens to all of us. So again, if people are willing to put in the chat some ways that it, um, in their practice, mm -hmm. I know I can talk about like when I'm in time, when I'm in times of high stress, high trauma, um, I am more prone to, to miss a deadline um, mm -hmm. and then have to file a motion for a late filing or sometimes less able yeah. to answer the phone. Um, because I feel there's so much stimulation that that, that can sometimes feel overwhelming. Um, yeah, it slows me down since it distracts me. I mean, that again, I think is a is a great example. Like sometimes there'll be so much to do and so much like it will feel so overwhelming that it will be hard to that it can be hard to start. Yeah. Um, so productivity productivity suffering it goes along perfectly with that. Um, and I just want to also clarify that the different types of trauma that we experience come from different areas right there. And Sherry's going to talk about terms in a little bit. 
but they may, you know, the trauma comes again, not just from hearing stories that are hard, which is what we think of as exposure trauma, but you may experience burnout, which may impact how, um, how as an attorney, how your brain is functioning. Um, there may be something what we call compassion fatigue that again, Sherry's going to, we have a slide and we'll talk a little bit more specifically about each of these terms because while they are often interchanged, they're not identical. Um, and the guilt, it like guilt is its own, it's its, its entirely own category um, of a, of a form of trauma that can impact how the brain, how you, your executive functioning is working, is working, um, and your ability to practice. Yeah. Um, okay. I think one of the things that stands out to us most is that like everyone's human and you can't do this work and then be like, I'm just gonna get everything done anyway. Like, and if you are doing that, that's not sustainable. And that's, that's the title of this, that pushing through and pushing through may not be the best thing. So um, for example, um, Malika shared um, productivity suffers right after a screening and knowing that about yourself, one might schedule after a screening in a thoughtful way, like whether it's padding time or I need to, I get a coffee <laughs> after a screening or whatever it may be and understanding though that you're all overburdened. And so it's, you may not have the luxury of that kind of timing, but even sometimes just knowing that that would be ideal, you might find a way to give yourself at least three minutes, you know, like after a screening, I get to sit in my car and listen to classical music or I breathe or whatever works for you. And we'll get to some of those things as well. Um, I think the main thing with that diagram is that idea that like mammal, all mammals have the same structure. It's a mammalian thing. It's just humans have the, co the advanced cognition. And so when we are vulnerable to that, and so we are clumsy or we make a mistake because we're stressed, like that's human. It's not a shortcoming. Right. Um, and that's uh, right. I mean, and again, Sherry, thank you for that. And that's why we like are encouraging, you know, if you something occurs to you while we're talking, throw it in the chat, because again, our idea is to humanize it. And when we say that it impacts your ability to practice, that's all of us. Um, and so part of what we are going to talk about today is ways that we can talk about this more and normalize it um, instead of making this type of trauma within a, within a practice um, a shortcoming. It, it is a natural, unavoidable consequence of doing the work and of being human. Great. I think the other thing that's helpful for everyone to know is like from a psych like logical perspective and from a research prep perspective is not everybody who's gone through something hard, scary, overwhelming winds up with PTSD or all those trauma mm -hmm. symptoms. And so the, the individuality, and you've probably all seen that because you've had psych evaluations on your clients. So you know full well that there, there's a variation of what people experience and how they respond. And so some of it, that stress response is a normal reaction. We get the test taking, right? Like you, like taking exams and we always say, well, you also grow from doing some stressful things. Like there's, there's a middle ground somewhere as well. Um, and so that stress response can be for good or bad stresses. And hopefully it's manageable stresses for most of us, but for our clients, we know that it's, it's a larger amount and it's more overwhelming. Um, in terms of those concepts, I know there was a workshop yesterday on vicarious trauma, so we don't want to repeat a ton of information. And these definitions are kind of long. So I don't think it matters so much right now for us to distinguish among these, these concepts, except for to say that they are distinct. And it can be very helpful when you're having a really difficult time with your work and you aren't sure how to dig out or find your base of how you're going to proceed to figure out which one of these you might be dealing with um, so that you can name it. And I think that's really, really helpful to understand 
um, that responding to somebody's trauma with a sense of overwhelm, sadness, grief, um, guilt, any of those things, that doesn't mean you're burning out. You know, burnout has other symptoms and burnout is more of a flag that, that you need to be thinking through how much you're carrying and discuss that hopefully with um, colleagues or, you know, really looking at your workload and things like that. Um, and vicarious trauma is not the same as secondary trauma. And that part's really helpful to know as well, that there's a whole body of literature on these things as well. And so you have that in the handouts too. Um, and then um, I think you, I loved this. I pulled this from one of, this is in your handouts as well, but I liked it a lot. At the end of the day, whether you call it secondary trauma or vicarious trauma, what we're referring to is the impact of indirect exposure to difficult, disturbing, and or traumatic experiences of the suffering of others. And over time, it's that repetition that can have a negative effect on our, our functioning and our overall mental health. And that's important for us to develop our, a sense of our own warning signs and develop tools to mitigate those effects. And so that's kind of where we're headed is like, okay, now you understand a different lens for how overwhelming it can be. And then what can you do within that context? So, um, you know, so with this, with this idea of what it means, like uh, uh, literally being trauma informed, what does trauma mean? What types of trauma exist? What are the impacts of trauma? Um, these are all ways to have a trauma informed legal practice, um, mm -hmm. which I think is in a lot of ways, a buzzword that's thrown a, a thrown around and one of the things we want you to walk away with is the idea that like being trauma informed is not something that's that's clearly defined it doesn't have it's not a checklist that you can say oh well I've done x y and z and that it is something that's ongoing and that being like being here today um being in the um, worked up on trauma yesterday those are all parts of being having a trauma informed legal practice but the remaining trauma-informed is something that you have to continue to work at. We have to continue to work at this. Again, I don't want to use that you language because it it's all of us um, on a daily basis. Uh, um, and so we have a lot of strategies. We have some tools for you. And that's, we, we don't want to walk away. We don't want you to walk away feeling doom and, doom and gloom and inevitability. We want to give you some action steps um, that you can, some action steps that you can, um, that you can take. So, um, with that said, um, there are, with that said, well, you know, one of the things that you can look at is who, who you work for. Um, that's one of the biggest determinants of, like, your own well-being and on the other hand if you are an employer your practices may um your practices and how you treat your employees and how you, the culture in your workplace is going to be one of the biggest determinants of your employees well-being um, and that makes a lot of sense and is important to remember because we all may do similar work um as advocates for chil for children and immigration proceedings, but depending on our employment environment, that may have different impacts on us as practitioners. Um, so again, we do have some suggestions about how to, about how to maintain positive workplaces. Um, you know, Sherry touched on some of them thoughtful screening, I'm sorry, thoughtful timing, um, creating a space in the workplace mm -hmm. where people can debrief, where it's a safe place. And again, where it's acknowledged that everybody is having, the fact that you're having a feeling or a reaction to something that you did, as Sherry mentioned, doesn't mean that someone has PTSD, but it is normal that if you hear a very traumatic story from a child, 
that you may have some feeling. And so making that routine instead of only having an opportunity to debrief in the time of a crisis can really help to um, can really help to improve the culture of a workplace. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that we um, one of the things that um, a, like a manager can do is attend, like encourage people to continue to in attend different types of trainings on trauma um, and to have more control over their schedules. Um, <coughs> one of the greatest ways to reduce vicarious trauma is to reduce the hours working directly with traumatized individuals. And so that might mean having a bigger workforce um, so that that can be spread over various people, recognizing that that's hard, that there aren't always the resources. There aren't always the resources to do that. Um, we, you know, we talk about boundaries and we talk about, so we talk about self-care, um, and the boundaries aren't just, you know, boundaries mean many things and boundaries can mean, you know, boundaries with clients. They can also mean boundaries with yourself and reminding yourself what your role is and what your role isn't. And I sometimes, I think that someone referred to it earlier on in the chat, like, and sometimes that's the hardest for me. I want to fix, I want to solve all of the child's problems. And that's not a realistic boundary. And that creates like additional stress and trauma when I'm not able to do that. So again, and sometimes that's an easier boundary to set. Sometimes it's not than a boundary with a client who is, desperate um, and maybe separated from their separated from their family. Um, and when we talk about self-care, you know, like again, some of that was discussed yesterday. It's important to have uh, to have an environment where you can debrief about what what you've experienced. One of the advantages to having that in the workplace is that we do have um, you know, issues of confidentiality and privilege. So the workplace is a safe place to do that without, you know, your own workplace, your own organization is a place where you're more likely to be able to do that without threatening confidentiality. Um, for, and for me, um, there are a lot of Facebook groups that are available for, particularly for immigration attorneys that um, for me, when I'm struggling with any one of these things are often a safe place. Some are safer than others, it feels like, but um, a safe place for me to go and just get reinforcement. Like, yeah, this is hard and this is what we're all doing. And I'm not the only one who experiences that it's, that it's hard. Um, and I think that just like the last thing on this slide, allow your own enjoyment of life despite clients suffering, I think is really, really, really important. Um, it's something that's come up a lot while we've actually been preparing is also the idea that like rest is a um, form of resistance. Um, and also, I think it can be important to remember that even when a client is suffering, that it's human to find enjoyment in life and that in your ability to find enjoyment in life, it may also encourage your client that in spite of all of the oppression and horrible things, there may be something to rejoice in. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I like the way that you said that. Um, I think that's one of the hardest things with this type of work. And I think that's where people wind up really um, overextending themselves and maybe um, not allowing some of those moments of joy that you just, in order to sustain, you have to have both. And you'll notice on this slide, it talks about resi resilience boosting practices. And I think I should mention resilience, you know, that's the, like you, you know, that we grow that capacity and um, for children, for everyone, the most, the strongest, thing that helps us grow resilience is a safe trusting relationship and so that's why working in isolation as so many of you all do 
is extra hard. And if you can have these connections with others, it is going to boost your resilience and it's not just your partner or, you know, like whether I'm talking marital partner or work partner, but like having an, a little bit of a network that gives you some support because that's our greatest buffer as human beings is consistent and um, reliable relationships. And it's painful that we can't give that to all of the children we serve, but we still have to do that for ourselves so that we can keep showing up for the kids. I mean, I think that's the, the overarching message. And then in terms of the brief debrief communications, I would really encourage you all to think about putting that into your work routine that you have deliberate meetings, even if you think you have nothing to talk about, that you just have that routine. It's kind of like having a routine therapy appointment versus going as needed. If you go as needed, you only go when you have a crisis. And if your staff and your team only meet when you have a crisis, like that's not a healthy way of operating. You should be meeting routinely. And then that helps because then if you're, you do have like a nightmare of a hearing on Tuesday, you can say, oh, I know we have our meeting tomorrow, I'm going to get to debrief about it. And that's good for me. And so briefing is the preparation and debriefing is af afterwards and looking out for each other a little bit, like what's coming down the pike. And that gives you the structure that when you have critical incident debriefing, when there is something really tragic and intense, that you have a framework for how you discuss these things. So remembering what we, um, know about the brain, the next thing we're going to do is talk about how do we strategically handle a dysregulated person, and that could be ourselves, a staff member, or a client. And probably you all do this intuitively, um, but we wanted to give you some visuals to help. So like the, the previous slide was a little bit like, how do you put the prevent some structures in that increase your scaffolding so that you're less rattled by things. And then this is talking about, well, what happens when someone is rattled? Like, you know, you, you, you have to get your, the work done and they're rattled. And so we go back to this, like the map of the brain and we look at, well, it's all gonna, just like it develops from bottom up and we use it from bottom up. So the information coming in it's from the central nervous system and up the brain stem and getting processed in each reason, in each region, then you're also looking for, that's the regulation piece starts at the bottom and then works its way up. So you're gonna create opportunities to regulate the nervous system. And in the beginning with someone who's really distressed, you think about soothing a baby, you're rocking, you're patting, you're shushing, right? And then when they finally start to calm down, you might be like, oh, you know, look at the picture of the bird, right? And, you, and, and then they're able to engage a little bit and they like the sound of your voice and you're able to do that. And then because they're connecting with you, they relax a little bit more. And then you're finally able to say like, for the 39th time, now can we put your pajamas on, right? <laughs> you know, like, you, like the goal is all the way out here, but you going through the soothing and the pleasure and the connection and then the ask of the cognitive piece. And so on the next slide, we give some examples of what each of these things might include. Um, and everybody's different. And so what soothes one person might trigger another. And so you really want to keep that in mind. I learned that my daughter's totally opposite me. Like I like a warm drink. She likes an icy drink when she's upset. I don't understand that, but I know I've learned from her what she likes. And so I pay attention to that. And I'm sure you've all intuitively done that with friends and colleagues and loved ones. Um, and so if we're trying to be supportive of someone who's overwhelmed, crying, yelling, whatever it may be, or just distressed, of, you know, ourselves, um, we reduce stimuli and then gradually ask about individual preferences. Um, and then as you're able to do that, you can ask a little bit more and give some, a lot of autonomy about what they'd like to do. You know, would you like to, I make the other thing as a glass of water because almost everybody will accept a glass of water. Um, you can't scream, you can't cry while you're drinking. Like it's interrupts some of that cycle and it helps restore breathing. Uh, and then being a consistent relational connection provides that buffering. Um, 
And so we're all different in how we do this, but like, I know, like I find puzzles, I'm sorting. Um, I had a friend a couple months ago and her high school age son was in really falling apart. And she was like, I don't know what to do for him. Like he cannot settle tonight. And I was like, can, do you have anything he can sort? And he sorted his Legos from when he was little. And it did the, tr- like, it just, he needed to settle. It wasn't time to figure out what test or college application he was stressed out about. It was just how to settle. And the so- sorting is a very good thing. Puzzles, walking. Um, walking is like the number one thing I would prescribe for almost anybody. Um, berating yourself for not being cognitively productive never works. So that we would not recommend. We look at these things. And so one of the tools that I developed in working with early childhood educators, and I think it would work for you all too, is something called the self-regulation passport. We don't have time for the activity, but I can describe it a little bit. Um, I give out at the beginning of the workshop, I give out one index card and I ask people to write on the front of it, what's something that you like to do to relax. And then we do some sharing. You could repeat this in a staff meeting if you wanted to. And then we flip the card over and I say, okay, what list on the back things that you do for yourself when you need to calm down? Like those are two different things, relaxing versus calming down. And so just helping people separate the two things. And then later on, I get, I do this whole presentation of how the brain works and that's all based on the senses, right? And so we look at, always looking at the five senses, especially in these, the bottom two, the red and the yellow boxes there, looking at the five senses. So then we do another index card. We say, what are things that soothe you when you're distressed? You know, sight, sound, smell, touch, and taste everybody's different, what works for them. And sometimes there's a sense that we ignore a lot. So having the prompt for all five is really helpful because people will be like, well, you know, I do like, like I'm not an aromatherapy person, but I like the smell of this one flower. Well, maybe then you would buy that essential oil and have it around, you know, like you may learn something about yourself where the, that the smell of freshly brewed coffee or tea is soothing to you. And so you start to notice it because we've asked for all five. And then you flip the card over and we say, what are things that you dislike when you're, when you're distressed? And that's really helpful because everybody's got all sorts of funny things. Like there's a lot of people who are like, do not touch me. And so many of us, our instinct when someone is distressed is to touch. And so it's really helpful to know with the person you're dealing with, what soothes them and what doesn't soothe them. And I would say that you could have a trauma-informed workplace where you learn these things about each other and also where you could embed it into your interviews with clients. And I think it's a a way to even introduce when you're talking with clients and you're like, we're going to talk a lot about a lot of sensitive things. And can you tell me what's helpful for you, you know, when you're upset so I can be considerate of you? And is there stuff that you really don't like and, and just get really concrete. And you can say, do you like a warm drink or a cold drink, you know, or it's there, whatever it may be. And everybody's different. Um, so I wish we had more time, but I think that that idea is something that you could add to your practice very easily. Um, so we've created a bit of a, uh, um, a formula to help you think about how to have a sustainable, integrative, trauma-informed law practice. And there are two pieces. There's one, the organizational culture, and the other is your personal practice. Um, really, the organizational culture, for those of you who come from the nonprofit world, um, the idea of having mission, vision, and values may be something that is already a part of your organization. I'm in private practice. Um, and I don't think that most private practitioners ha- like have an established mission, vision, and values necessarily. It's something that I know from, um, from my work in other contexts. But thinking about the mission, vision, and values of my law firm is really helpful in identifying what are, what are my boundaries, right? Because otherwise I'm working without any access, without like any um, compass 
And the mission, vision, and values really helps to decide like, oh, this is my compass. These are my goals. Um, is this project furthering those goals or is this project not furthering those goals? So an example might be to sustainably provide pro and low bono services in a limited resource context um, with, with boundaries. That might be an example of a mission. Um, I think that something else, if you're maybe in private practice, um, I get, like sometimes, at least for me, I feel uncomfortable talking about like, I need to be able to feed my 15 month old child. And that can be part of your, part of your mission, right? Like sustain the sustainability means in a way so that like my needs are also met, which isn't selfish. It's part of your mission. Mm -hmm. um, we can talk about wellness and mental health organizations that don't promote that I think are problematic and people you know most people have sick time but sick time or like it's time to go to the doctor is not something that's necessarily meant to be on a weekly basis um, and organizations could consider like giving people an hour a week to go to therapy because you know as sherry mentioned with the the idea of debriefs just like the idea of therapy that's not something that we're doing on an as needed basis usually in order for it to be successful it's something that like you have to do as routine so whether it's giving people time or um, creating flexible work schedules so that people may be able to have some sort of mental health care um which like during work hours if necessary like again those are things those are changes that organizations can implement um as we're talking about also organizations can think about maybe like do they if they offer benefits do their health benefits cover a wide range of mental health options which is maybe a good transition to the personal praxis where we talk about the idea that like one thing that you can do to um you know, to one thing that you can do as part of this formula is ensure that you are receiving appropriate mental health care. Um, and we want to normalize that. And there is not a one size fits all for mental health care. Seeing a therapist doesn't have to necessarily mean talk therapy. There are different kinds of therapy. Um, but having, but mental health care is something that can help everybody and is a question of finding what is the right fit for you. Um, and then relying on the tools, relying on your knowledge of the brain and thinking about like the path and the regulators so that you can maybe try to self-regulate a little bit better. Um, and we think that, you know, implementing with personal practices and organizational practices really does allow for the integration, you know, like integrating those two things and remembering that one is no, you, you can't only have one side of the formula. It has to be both professional and personal. Like there have to be um, tools, both professionally and personally um, in order to truly have that trauma-informed practice. And um and again, this can be hard when you're not in charge of your organizational culture, but maybe there are things that you can that you can bring to that you can gently bring to your organization and mm -hmm. be leaders. Um, in terms of like outfacing strategies, because those are like more um, more in like inward facing. Um, thinking about thinking about how we're talking about clients, how we are interacting, inter, I don't know what word that was trying to be, <laughs> interacting with clients. Um, you know, Sherry talked about like starting, like creating a routine where when you're doing an intake, you're finding out what works for the for a client, what doesn't work for their client. You know, some people might like touch, some people might not like touch. Um, mm -hmm. And some people might, um, you know, thinking about the tone of voice that you're using, thinking about 
like how long you're going over a topic, thinking about like whether or not someone wants to be accompanied. For one count for one client, it might feel helpful to have a trusted friend or a family member with them accompanying them for support. For someone else that might get, feel more vulnerable. So, you know, again, this really goes to like making that part of your routine intake, not just like why did you leave your country of origin? Who do you live with? Like, do you, you know, not, not just a legal intake, but like an integrative intake so that we can try to meet our clients' um, emotional needs, mm -hmm. emotional needs better. And so that we can, through the way that we practice with them, um, help them self, help them self-regulate. Yeah, I wanted to say that I think that the more you do that, you actually pick up efficiency as well, because the fallen apart client, like, I mean, it, it, having ways of regrouping from that or understanding up front that someone might need to chunk the screening, that like the, that's just not realistic to do it all in one sitting. Um, these things actually might improve some of the efficiency. It should hopefully become less taxing or you have fewer incidents that kind of get you off the chart. Um, some of the things that we wanted to add in here are like focusing on the client's sense of agency at all time, giving them choices on little and big things, um, thoughtfulness about how close to sit and stand, having several chairs if possible. I know when we're like in detention centers, you have no choices, but in some other settings, you can let them choose where to be. And that's really as much as you can. And you may, even if there's only two chairs ask them, I'm going to put my chair over here. Is that all? <laughs> like ask some of that giving control to them. And then um, I know for us, we've developed a companion activity while Lara's doing the legal screening so that children aren't just, we want to keep them from being passive. We want them to feel active. And so that they have an activity to do while you're doing the hard work. Um, so we have an activity book, drawing, anything that has them in a parallel process. And then with these other pieces out facing, we wanted to make sure that you have that psychoeducation embed information embedded in evaluation and reports and letters to judges. Um, we, th those things can be embedded. Um, and then I know um, we were going to talk a little bit about um, Requesting reasonable accommodations, and that's more your um, spot, Laura, to, it's from the attorney's perspective, um, but we do have um, samples in the handouts about reasonable accommodations for PTSD, which we believe belong in, um, I do them in psych evaluations, I always include them, Laura can speak more about how that fits in the casework. Yes. So if you are, um, and I've really changed how I think about these, but if you're in a, um, in a courtroom setting, for example, if you're in a hearing, you can make a, um, requests for accommodations about the tone of voice that is used when speaking with a, a child. You can make requests about who is asking the questions. Typically, we think of it you know, you have your direct examination and your cross-examination, you might make a request that like all of the questions come from the, you know, come from the attorney. Um, you might make um, requests that like for time limits. Um, so even if that means like continuing a hearing or on the contrary, like, you might not want to continue the hearing over because that might just be re-traumatizing to have to revisit it. So you would need to work with um, you would need to work with a mental health professional to evaluate what is best for each client, um, for each child. But think about like you can think about there's really no limit on the types of accommodations that you can ask for. Um, and think about like in each case, what setup is going to be the best for this child. Um, yeah. That's great. Thank you. I'm noticing we only have a couple of minutes left and we're 
this is our last informative slide. We may not have a lot of time for Q and A. Um, we just hit a, you know, so we've talked a lot about the tools and the resources. Um, there is a self-assessment um, tool. I mean, I think that one of the hardest things with trauma sometimes, especially when you as a practitioner are feeling it, is or experiencing it rather than feeling it, it um, is to identify it in yourself. Um, and so the self a self assessment tool maybe is more objective than like the, you reflecting on it. Um, and let me just say the tool that we gave you comes from the center. Um, I forgot the proper name of it, the Center for um, Survivors of Torture, and it's designed for people who work with survivors of torture. So it's both spot on appropriate for the work that everyone here is doing. That's not just like some vague self-assessment. And then we also wanted to leave some recommendations for the legal field um, that we can all think about. Um, you know, the bar, the bar association, for example, can vary giving related to mental health relating to trauma. And so as colleagues within ourselves, um, changing how we think about mental health and how we think about character and fitness, um, advocating for policy changes within our own organizations. And if you're in a position to change your organization's policies, then like maybe consider changing your policies to make them um, more, to make them more mental health friendly and to promote the well-being of your employees, which will then promote the well-being of the children that you work with. Um, and you know, just remembering that like this is not a one and done. So encouraging that we continue to talk about like how we can be trauma informed and continue to talk about tools and develop tools. Um, it, we really encourage, you know, encourage that um, that 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 you don't think, oh well, I went to this one training or I went to two trainings, and so I have a trauma informed practice. Organization and yourself like continue the work. Um, so that it becomes embedded and integrated and it doesn't become like this additional thing to think of. It's just naturally part of what you are, part of what you are doing. Um, I think as Sherry said, that ends our um, formal presentation, um, but we are open to questions and answers. Uh, we're open to questions that for which we can have answers. One of the questions um, that I received is how does one request accommodations, whether it's through a written motion or orally at a hearing? Um, so the way that we have done it in the past, I think that there are multiple ways that you can approach that. Um, one, when I present an expert report, like in a mental health evaluation, I ask the mental health evaluator. I don't know if I asked or if in this case, um, they was just um, they were just offered and it was very helpful. And so now I ask for to include in that expert report recommendations for what would be necessary in a hearing um, for that person to be successful so that like the judge is seeing it before the hearing. I would recommend including it before the hearing. Um, depending on the extent of um, the extent of trauma and the extent that it may impact a child's ability to uh, a child's ability to testify, you could also consider requesting a matter of MAM hearing um, because again, there can cognition and mental health trauma are different, but. Um, but a matter a matter of MAM hearing may be a way to also help establish that a child, because of the trauma that they have experienced, needs accommodations. But again, I would, I think that I would likely put it in a motion, and then be be prepared to also talk about it at the hearing, which is what we've done at least where we are. Um, I'm not sure that our judges are always used to receiving those types of motions. But I don't want the first time that the judge hears about it to be at the individual hearing. And especially with our 
Opa, I don't see that going over well either. Even if they don't look at it, I don't want that to be because I didn't give it to them. Yeah. Well, our information is on the materials you've received and on the slides. Um, you're welcome to reach out to us if you have any questions. I put in the chat and it's in your handouts too. Mariposa Legal um, has done a nice job. They do an annual check-in for trauma exposure for attorneys who work in immigration. And um, Hannah is putting those on, they're on her YouTube page. So truly, like if you wanted to do your quarterly check-in, you could just go and go to that video. And that would be one thing that you could do for yourself that would in her um strategies resonate because it's designed specifically for the work that everyone here is doing. So great. Well thank you all.